Good morning. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Let me stand over here a little bit so you can see over my right shoulder. Uh, there's a little fella sitting behind us, uh, our only son, Joshua. We welcome him to the video today. We welcome you to our yes. church without walls. You don't have to come where we are because God enables us to come where you are. And we welcome you to our church without walls. Yes. Today we're going to sing an old song, of course. This one goes way back to 1977. I'm just a younger, younger feller then. My house is full, but my fields are empty. have to move the music before I knock it down. Mm. 
somebody's got your Bible today. Probably left it in the cart. Yeah. The seat of the cart. <laughs> we're getting there. <laughs> Us old folks, we're getting there. So while Josh was gone to get Gail's Bible, we left it in the living room. You can get your Bible and turn with me, please, today to the book of Matthew, of course. I love the book of Matthew. You know it. There's so much in there. You could just have quite a buffet, if you want to call it that, in the book of Matthew. But today we're going to go to chapter 20, Matthew chapter 20, a familiar story, of course, the older you get, the longer you've been in the church and the Bible, the more familiar you get with these stories. So it's strange to think that there might be somebody today who's watching this video and they've never heard this story before. That's what the Lord told me many years ago when the Lord called me to be a preacher. I thought to myself, but Lord, there are so many preachers out there. What difference will one more make? And then I ask him, Lord, how do I preach a gospel that's been preached for a thousand years? <laughs> you know what he told me? He said, preach it like it's never been preached before. <laughs> so I know without a doubt that he knew that there would be people every day that would hear the gospel for the first time. So today, reading from the book of Matthew, chapter 20. Now, my Bible, it is all written in red, meaning the very words of Jesus were recorded by Matthew. So I hope that makes a difference in your life. But let's start with Matthew 20 and verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder or landlord, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, that was a day's wage back then, a penny, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, underline that, whatsoever is right. You already know I'm 71 years old. I gave my heart and, Lord, heart and Savior to the Lord in 1980. It's been 43 years. And he's going to do what's right in the end for you and for me. As the Bible says, wait for it. Isn't it, Gail? Habakkuk? Yes, sure. The vision is for an appointed time. <laughs> It's like I was talking to somebody the other day at Walmart, of course, my hangout, that the Bible says in Hebrews, it's appointed unto man once to die and after this, the judgment. And it's like I have said it for a long, long time. You are born with an expiration date. We don't know when, but you and me were born to die. Some sooner some later, and I believe there's going to be a handful of people who have not died yet when the Lord returns and calls us up out of here. I might be one, you might be one, who never has to taste death. But we do have an appointment with it if time tarries. So the third hour in, well, I've already read that. In verse 4, he told the people, go out and I'll do whatever is right. I will give you. And they went their way. Matthew 20 and verse 5. Again, he went out about the sixth and ninth hour and did likewise. In other words, this landowner started early in the morning and continued to go out all day long looking for 
people to labor in his vineyard, meaning he was not satisfied with the number of laborers that he got early nor midday, but he was still looking for people because you'll see in a little bit, the harvest is great. In verse six, it says, and about the 11th hour, he went out and found others standing idle and said unto them, why stand ye here all the day idle? I'm talking to somebody today. You've been lying to yourself. You heard me. You have lied to yourself. You were invited to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior long ago, and you keep telling yourself one day, someday, not today. You know what? You keep that up and you'll go to hell. Because one day the death angel will sneak up on you when you least expect it and he'll take you out of here. I believe with all my heart that there are many voices in hell lifted up saying, but God, I was going to give you my life next Sunday, next week. I was going to go to church. Lord, I was going to. And you know and I know that hell is paved with good intentions. People that were gonna, gonna. That's just like every January, New Year's, multitudes of people say, well, I'm gonna go on a diet. I quit lying to myself. I would start out in January cutting back on things, and by March, I would forgot all about it. So finally, I came to the conclusion, I'm not going to lie to myself anymore. I am not going to diet. I'm just going to eat and drink what I need to and live. Somebody today, you're standing at a crossroads. And you've been there too long. You hear what I said? <laughs> You have been standing in the crossroads too long. And if you don't soon move, you will not go any farther than what you have. Let me say that again. You have been standing at the crossroads too long. And if you don't soon move, you never will. The landowner said, why stand ye here all the day idle? Why have you stood so long and not made a decision, not made a choice? Do you know that this Bible says no man has the promise of tomorrow? You don't have the promise of tomorrow. In verse 7, here's what they said. They say unto him, because no man hath hired us. So he said unto them, okay, go ye also into the vineyard. And listen, and whatsoever is right that shall you receive. Whatever's right, I'll take care of it. Let me ask you today, do you trust the decision of God? Do you trust that he will do what's right? I confess, since moving to Tennessee, I have been challenged. I have been challenged since moving to Tennessee that he has done what is right by me and Gail and my family. That's why the Bible says the just shall live by faith and he that endureth to the end shall be, not was, not are, but Jesus said he that endureth to the end shall be saved. 
So the landowner, according to Jesus, promised the people who went to work in the 11th hour, the last hour of the day, you will receive whatever is right. Verse 8, Matthew 20 and verse 8, So when evening was come, the Lord of the vineyard, in other words, the evening is when the work is over. Do you know the day is coming? very soon now that the labor of the body of Christ will be over in this life. In the next life, in the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, the believers now will be rulers and kings and priests according to the Bible. You won't be a worker. You'll be a ruler in the kingdom that's coming. When Jesus sets up his rule in Jerusalem and after the battle of Armageddon and he rules the whole world according to the Bible for a thousand years, the saints will rule and reign the world with him. Do you not understand it's going to be a monarchy? There will be but one king that will rule the world and his name is Jesus. It will no longer be a democracy where the majority rule. And you and me both know, especially here in the United States of America, the majority does not rule. In America, the rich and the corrupt, the evil, are ruling. But at the end of the day, the landowner, the landlord, saith unto his steward, Call the laborers and give them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. Those who came to work at the end of the day will be rewarded first. And then we will go down the line. Gradually, we'll get to those who've worked all day long, and they too will be rewarded. Matthew 20 and verse 9, And when they came that were hired about the eleventh hour, the last hour of the day, they received every man a penny, a day's pay. And they had only worked one hour. But when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more. They worked all day long. And they likewise received every man a penny. They worked all day and got the same pay as the one who only worked one hour. And when they had received it, typical, they murmured against the good man of the house. I can't tell you how many times as a pastor over the years, I've encountered this when church people think they deserve a position because they've been attending that church longer than the newcomers when the newcomers may be sent of God, anointed of God, chosen by God, and they're the ones to do what needs to be done because these other people have sit idle on their hands and on their butts for too long. Idle. You know and I know if you don't do what God has called you to do, he will give your job to somebody else. Some people have already lost it. God can't use them. They won't listen. They haven't learned. They won't obey him. Don't you remember the story that Jesus told about the two sons? And the father told the first son, I need work out in the field. Go and do some work for me. And the boy says, glad to do it, dad. I'll go do it. But the Bible says he didn't. And then the father got a hold of the second son and says, I need you to go out in the field today and work for me. And the second son said, no, I don't feel like it. Not today, dad, not today. But shortly thereafter, the second son had a second idea and went to the field and did the work his father wanted done. So Jesus asked, 
Who did the will of the Father? The first son who said, I will and did not, or the second son who said, I will not and did. Jesus said, which one of them did the will of the Father? <laughs> and Jesus said, the second son who didn't want to do it, but did. He did the will of the I'm telling you today, you may not want to do what God has called you to do. You may not want to do it. That don't matter. What matters is, will you do it, want to or not? I've said it lots of times. I never wanted to be a preacher. My daddy was a preacher. My daddy was a pastor. I didn't want to live under the scrutiny of deacons and elders and committees. I didn't want it. But when God called me to be a preacher, he put the want to in my heart. And for 30 years, I had to deal with what my daddy dealt with, politics in the church, back scratching. Yeah, leaders of the church will promote you if you do what they want. I'll never forget the day that I was licensed in the denomination and to be ordained and one of the state officials pulled me aside and told me he said, you will not go far in this conference if you don't play ball with this board. I had no idea what he was talking about. But I observed people that would play golf with the officials, people that would volunteer to work around the conference for free for the officials, they're the ones who got the better churches. They're the ones who got the pay raises. And when it came time to nominate somebody to sit on the platform, they are the ones who were chosen. And it turned out to be just what he said. I lasted in that denomination for seven years. And then I was excommunicated because I dared to believe God. You didn't play ball. I did not play ball with that conference board and they terminated my ministry in their denomination. Some of you know exactly who I'm talking about. The people that worked all day complained that the newcomers got paid just as much. Look at verse 12. Here's what they said, saying, these last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them what? Equal unto us, which have borne the burden and heat of the day. We did what we were told all day long in the heat of the day, and they got as much as we did. <clears throat> Excuse me. But the landowner, the landlord answered in verse 13, but he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst thou not agree with me for a penny? In other words, before you ever set foot in my field, you agreed to work all day for a penny and you got what you agreed to. Is it not lawful? Well, wait a minute. Back up to verse 14. Take that thine is and go thy way. Take your wages and go. I will give unto the last even as unto the... Do what I want to. I'm the landlord. I'm the landowner. I want to tell you something right now. It's not up to you. It's not up to your mother. It's not up to your wife or your husband for you to receive a reward at the end of your journey. He will determine what to give you. And I promise you, He will give each of us more than we deserve, more than we have earned, above and beyond what we have asked or even believed. 
He gave the final workers a day's pay just like he gave the all-day workers a day's pay. Here's what he said in verse 15. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Ain't it mine? Can't I decide what I'm going to do with it? Look at what Jesus said. Verse 15. Is thine I evil because I am good? If you ever stop to think when you die, I die, and we get to heaven, getting to heaven going to be the first prize. The fact that you made it will mean more than anything. Second, you're going to get a robe of righteousness, a white robe of righteousness once you arrive. And you're going to receive the crown of life. Whether you have served the Lord for 40 years or whether you have served the Lord for four days. God decides who he will bless. Some people say, well, Brother Eddie does this Mr. So-and-so, does God love him more? He's blessed. No, that man more likely is more faithful than you. God rewards the faithfulness of his people. Have you not read the scripture, to whom much is given, much is required? Have you ever stopped to think, God may have required more of that brother, therefore he's given that brother more than you? Because he knew you, he couldn't require much of you because you weren't going to produce. You're like that first son who said, I'll go, but didn't. How many of you today have promised God you'd do something and you ain't done it? Stop and think for just a minute. What have you promised God and you have not done it? My Bible says it's better not to make a vow than to make a vow and not keep it because God's going to hold you uh, accountable to any promise or vow you have made him. Some of you say, well, God, if you'll give me a better job, I'll give you more of my money. And you didn't. You just bought a new car. You just bought a new truck. You are looking to buy a bigger, fancier house so you can pay more taxes. And it's not all about money. God forbid it's not all about money. Some of you have promised the Lord if he'd save your family, you'd be a better witness and you have not been. Don't you know you're going to stand before God and give an account for what you have not done? Do you not understand this Bible says that every believer is going to stand before God and give an account for every idle word that has proceeded out of your mouth? Do you not understand you're going to give an account for everything you have said? Whatever you told the Lord, I will do. He's going to hold you to it. He never said you had to want to. I didn't want to be a preacher, but I submitted to the will of God and became a preacher. I didn't want to be a pastor, but I submitted to the will of God and became a pastor. Most of my adult life, has been doing what I did not want to do because I did it as the Lord instructed me to do it. Here's what Jesus says in verse 16. So the last shall be first and the first last. Look at this, underline it. Here it is. You wondered where it was. Matthew 20 and 16. Jesus said, Jesus said, <laughs> for many be called, but few chosen. Hey, 
the chosen ones are the one who show up and do the work. Are you among the chosen today? Just out of curiosity, I had somebody to write me one time and said, Brother Eddie, could you explain that? Many are called, but few are chosen. I thought, yeah, I got an example. So let me share this example with you. And you can Google it and find out. As Jesus said that he that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. In the Navy, they have what they call Navy SEALs. The training is very, very rigorous. It's very stressful physically. It's very stressful mentally, emotionally. And most of those who start the training do not finish. So out of curiosity, I Googled it. Now get this. For 1,000 men who go into the program... Six to 20% graduate. Did you hear what I just said? Out of 1,000 men who start the Navy SEAL training program, most of them are washed out because they can't take it physically. They can't take it mentally. They just can't take the training and they wash out. In other words... 60 to 200 men, somewhere give or take there, out of a 1,000 graduate. So let me back up and give you the verse of Scripture where Jesus said, he that endureth to the end. You know and I know we are going to be, have been, and will be tested and tried. I've been tested more this year than I have in many, 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 many years. And I want to tell you something, it hurts. But you're going to be tested and tried in order for God to find out who's worthy to serve and rule and reign with him for a thousand years. He's giving you every opportunity today to get on with it, to cross the crossroads, take the journey he's given you, do what he's asked. Either you will or you won't. Whether you want to or not don't matter. Just do it. Some of you right now, you're saying, well, I'm waiting on the Lord. No, you ain't waiting on the Lord. He's waiting on you to make up your mind, to decide whether you want more money, more car, more truck, more house. And I know we're approaching that time of year when men grab their guns and run out in the woods and spend hundreds of dollars to try to bag a deer when they could save a lot of time and money and just go to the grocery store and buy a good juicy steak. You know I'm not a hunter. I'm not a fisherman. When I was a boy, my daddy took me fishing, I think, twice. So I never became a fisherman. I'm not a sportsman. I don't care who wins a game. The best man win regardless of what uniform, regardless of what university he plays for. I don't care. The best man win. I root for the guys that are determined to win. It's easy to lose. Many are called, but only a few will pass the test. I'm determined I'm going to pass the test if it kills me. Gail struggles. Ask Joshua. He's sitting right here. Yes. Gail has a hard time getting up, getting dressed, making it to the music room, playing this keyboard. She sits here before we record and cries because it hurts. She's in pain. 
We keep hoping and believing that one day, someday, God's going to answer our prayers. At 71 years of age, I've told the Lord a number of times, Father, have we not suffered long enough? Nevertheless, Jesus said it in the Garden of Gethsemane when they were about to crucify him. Jesus said it. Father, let this cup pass from me. Meaning, Lord, I don't want to do this. I really don't want to do this. But Jesus went on to say, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And they crucified him. But the shedding of his blood on the cross is what it takes to wash away your sins and mine. If Jesus had not suffered the cross, no man would be saved. Heaven would be empty. Except for the two-thirds of the angels that remain when Satan was kicked out. God wants a family. He wants a family that's been through hell and back, but kept on struggling to endure what it takes to make it and please him. He's pleased when you suffer and still do it. Anybody can refuse to do it because they suffer. Who am I talking to today? Who am I talking to today? Matthew chapter 9 and verse 38 says, pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers, laborers, people willing to do the work, not spectators. I've been a pastor for a long time and you go to a building they call the church and 80% of the people sitting there are spectators. They don't want to do nothing. They come to church wanting something. They want you to do something to bless them. They came for a blessing. They did not come to be a blessing. No wonder there's no power in what they call the church today. Those buildings. The buildings are not the church. I keep telling you that. The buildings are not the church. It's we, the people, are the church of the living God. Luke chapter 10 and verse 2. Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great. The harvest is great, but the laborers are few. They ain't enough out there doing what they ought to be doing. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into the harvest. Ask God. That's what he's talking about. They some been in a church for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, and they're dry as dust and not on the law. They ain't done nothing, and they ain't going to do nothing. Or ain't going to do anything. Some of you English scholars. I had a lady in my church years ago who fits this description, and one time she told me, well, Pastor, still water runs deep. I had to bite my tongue. I wanted to tell her, still water don't run at all. And she didn't. She was a dry knot on the log. There are so few people in the house of God today that are willing to work in the heat of the day, in the heat of the battle, when it hurts, when it's painful. They're willing to work for what is right. Did you not realize that all that we do, the Bible says, do it all for what? For the wages? The Bible says, do all that you do for the glory of God, for his glory. Do all that you do for the glory of God. You say, oh, Brother Eddie, I, I don't feel qualified. Well, let me read you Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. The Bible says in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, 
but you shall, say that, you shall receive power after, not before, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the othermost part of the earth. Jerusalem was home for the church. Let me say that. You're to be witnesses at home first. If you ain't a witness at home, you ain't a witness. If you can go out in the streets and be a witness, but you can't do it at home, you ain't an effective witness. The Bible says, let a deacon be somebody that is spoken well of by his family and friends. What do people think about you? Are you well spoken of? Now, granted, be careful because the Bible says, beware when all men speak well of you, for so did they the prophets before you. Beware if everybody speaks well of you. Some ain't right. As I've shared before, just this week I was at Walmart and the lady behind the counter is a believer. And whenever I go, we talk about the Bible. We talk about Jesus if there's not busy. So this past week when I went to the counter, the lady was there and we were talking and she said, oh, by the way, Pastor, you remember the other day when we were standing here talking about Jesus? I thought, I sure do and I enjoy it. She said, there was a lady behind you that complained and she said it was inappropriate for you to talk so loud about Jesus at Walmart. My wife will tell you, I talk loud everywhere. I can remember many a times in church, she'd say, whisper. And I don't know how to whisper. I've never heard my dad whisper. When I was a little boy and we would go out to eat, my daddy would tell me at the table, Eddie, why do you talk so loud? I don't know. I always have. And I might always will. God, for whatever reason, gave me a voice to be heard. Now, I'm human. Sometimes I say things I ought not. And I have to repent because I know better. But once in a while, I get in the flesh too but I don't stay there. See, that's the mercies of God. James chapter one, is it verse nine, Gail? First James, whatever. James one and nine. If we confess our sins. First John one nine. There you go. Thank you, Gail. First John one nine. If we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. It is the verse. So when you do something wrong, say something wrong, you won't go to hell for it. But you need to repent and tell God you're sorry that you kind of dipped down in the flesh for a minute. Keep in mind, even Peter, I love Peter. Peter denied he even knew Jesus Peter cursed and swore he didn't know the man when he feared for his life. And when Jesus came up out of the tomb, he told him, go tell the disciples and Peter that I'm risen from the dead. And when the Holy Ghost fell in the upper room, Guess who the preacher was that day that 3,000 people were added to the church that day? <laughs> it was Peter. It was Peter. I love Peter. He walked on water and he sank. But he had enough sense to cry out to Jesus, Help me! Help! So Eddie Paul, a little bit like Peter, I don't mind hollering, help me, Jesus, I need help. Some of you need help 
You need to cry out and ask him for it. And then Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Whosoever I send, if you receive, not the one you're expecting, not the pastor, not the elder of the church, it may be the cart pusher in the parking lot at Walmart, Jesus said, if you receive, if you receive whosoever I send, you have received me. And if you receive me, you will have received the one that sent me. Quit being so fussy. Quit being a picker and chooser. Let God be God. I tell him all the time, you spoke through a donkey. You can use me. Amen? Amen. If God can speak through a donkey, he can speak through you. If you'll just open your mouth and let him. Father, in the name of Jesus, I come before you today on behalf of every man, woman, boy, and girl who is watching this video. You know where they are. You know where they need to be. You know what you want them to do, and you know what they're willing to do or not. Father, I just read it. It says, pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest to send laborers. Father, I pray that you will wake people up, that they will be willing to go to work for the Lord. And at some point in time, they will receive what is right. If not in this life, they will receive it in the life to come. Because Jesus said, our reward is with him when he comes. So Father, some of us just gonna have to wait on it. Father, I pray today that you would forgive all of us, Eddie, Paul, Gail, Joshua, Lord, I pray that you would forgive all of us our sins and iniquities. I pray, Lord, that you would cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Father, I pray today that our names will be forever written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Save the lost. Heal the sick. Cast out devils and raise the spiritually dead. Wake them up, Lord. Wake them up in time to get out there in the harvest and work. For we are in the 11th hour. In Jesus' name, amen. Don't forget, we offer you a free Bible, King James, King James giant print, Spanish Bible. Our ministry offers you a free Bible at no cost for shipping and handling either. But there's something you're going to have to do. You're going to have to go to igotmybible at gmail.com and that information is down below in the description box. It surprises me when people send me an email and or send me a message on YouTube and say, what's your email? I want, just look in the description box. All the information you need is right down there. But if you need a Bible, don't have a Bible, can't get a Bible. And remember, it's one Bible per address. Don't write me and say, Brother Eddie, I want three or four or five Bibles for my family. No. One Bible per address. Write, I got my Bible at gmail.com. Tell Laura whether you want a King James, King James giant print, or whether you want a Spanish speaking Bible, and Laura and her family will get that Bible out to you. Thank you to all of you for your cards, letters, prayers, support for Pakistan, Philippines. Homeless Ministry, Food Bank, Street Preacher, Eddie and Gail, all of the above. Thank you. 
And we pray that God will bless you and go above and beyond to meet your need as he is taking care of ours. So on behalf of Joshua and Gail and myself, we love you, thank you, and Lord willing, we will be back next week. God bless.